So yes, good afternoon and welcome to this session on navigating the digital transformation technology landscape by our expert Vikas Majumdar. Vikas is a career technologist having spent the last three decades in various roles with the last few years at this, as the CIO at Aditya Birla Payments Bank and Equifax. Vikas also spent some time working as Head of Digital Transformation and Innovation for the Aditya Birla Group advising their old economy businesses on their transformation strategy and execution. Vikas has recently set up an edtech and consulting venture, stemventor.com. The focus is on delivering learning programs on computing technology of the future, including cloud computing, blockchain, 3D printing, AR, VR, and drones. The programs cater to both students and professionals with a focus on hands-on learning for students and industry application orientation for professionals. Welcome, Vikas. Thank you, uh, Nita, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you, Ramesh and team, for setting up. I think these are uh, pretty exciting events. And thanks to all the participants for joining. Uh, let's hope that I'm able to make this interesting for you and add some value. All right. So uh, let's dive right in. Uh, you know, this is actually going to be the first of a series of three sessions that uh, we've agreed to have. Uh, the first one is going to actually just navigate the, the transformation technology landscape. Uh, I just want to bring to everyone's notice uh, what all is out there. There's a lot, right? And then the second aspect is to decide what is suitable for your business. Not every technology is required or suitable for all. Uh, not every technology is mature enough to be uh, adopted in an enterprise. So let's take a look at uh, how to classify that, how to have an approach to decide what can be used and so on, right? And then the next two sessions, which we will have over a period of time, uh, will be about planning and measuring the impact and outcomes of these technologies. And the third one will be about managing the technology operations and people uh, based on the choices you make, all right? So, uh, let's dive right in into session one now you know i'm taking a very interesting approach and uh, i hope you will allow me that uh, i'm you know normally i'm supposed to do a very quick introduction to myself like nita did but this is going to be a slightly longer introduction because you know what's interesting i found is that uh, some of the things that i've done through my career uh, also very nicely reflect how application has evolved Right. So although, you know, I'm going to spend the next three slides talking about, uh, you know, my career path, but the focus is not so much me. The focus is more about how digital adoption has evolved. Right. So let's get started. So, you know, way back in 1995, I actually had the great, great uh, fortune of working to set up Rediff.com. Now, those were the days when most people did not even know about the Internet and you had dial up modems and you know, very basic, almost text-based browsers. So uh, it was very, very early for Rediff.com, but if you think about it, uh, that was the first step towards starting to use all of the digital technologies and web services that are so prevalent today, right? The next thing that happened was, uh, and I, I worked with a very uh, early venture capital firm called eVentures. And in those days, we incubated companies like Make My Trip. Right now, this was 1999. So if you think back, if you look at the history of Make My Trip, you will see how early they have started to adopt uh, digital technology. And we're now in 2023. Uh, subsequently, I spent quite a few years working with iFlex, which is now Oracle. Now, even there, it was very interesting to see how investment banks in the early 2000s had started to adopt web and mobile technologies to provide solutions for their customers and keeping in mind the limitations of mobile and web applications then, right? So, so things have been happening. Uh, things have been evolving over many years. Uh, in 2012, I, I worked with a global remittances company to move to what we call today an open API architecture. More recently in 2017, I worked as the CIO with Aditya Birla Payments Bank. Now that was what we today call a digital first bank or a digital first business. All right. So when we talk of digital transformation, there is a, a, a preconception that you don't have much of digital right now. But imagine if you're digital first, you really don't do much transformation. You're already always digital, right? 
Then subsequent to that, I had a chance continuing with the same group, but I now started to help the older economy businesses, you know, more in manufacturing, logistics, mining, who did not have as much of technology. I mean, they have a lot of industrial technology, but not so much of digital technology. So there I noticed my first case of, you know, massive digital transformation, where you went from really almost no digitization to a whole lot of digital uh, initiatives, right? So, and, and it's also very interesting. And when we talk about the technology landscape, you will notice there are some solutions like IoT, AR, VR, and drones, which are actually of more relevance to manufacturing, mining kind of businesses. Right. And the more new age fintech financial services businesses are more likely to adapt things like AIML, blockchain and so on. So if you think about it, while we talk of digital transformation as a whole, uh, it, it means very different things depending on the nature of your business. And that's something that we will explore through this session. And hopefully that will give all of you in whatever business you are. Uh, a sense or a direction on how the technology adoption can can progress. All right. Um, in my last few uh, years was a, a big project for migrating a complete enterprise to the cloud. Uh, it's it's very very challenging. Uh, it sounds easy, hopping everything to the, but uh, it's a very very challenging challenging uh, initiative. And today, like Nita introduced, I thought I'd spread some things that I've learned and I'm into consulting and education on all of these kind of technologies, all right? So I hope you appreciate what I was trying to do is although this is my career path, it also gives you a sense of how uh, digital technology adoption has evolved from almost 20 years ago, all right? Or over the last 20 years. So let me just quickly set up text, although most people are aware of this, but I still want to repeat it so that we are all on the same page, all right? Uh, you know, you still have to qualify or classify anything that you do in the space of digital, right? The lowest level is actually what we call digitization. Now, it's pretty simple. As long as something is not in a physical format, it's digitized. So, like I've written there, if you still read a, a paper, a broadsheet newspaper, if you still take your notes on post-its, you know, you actually not digital, at least in that aspect of your life, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. You can choose to not go digital in many areas, but just to, to, to clarify that that is the very, very basic step of digitization. The next level you can go to, right, is what we call digitalization, right? Now, digitalization is to see how you can use the data that you capture using digital technologies right to improve your operations let's let's simply go back to the newspaper uh, system a very simple uh, application not a very high tech application but on a broadsheet newspaper you couldn't really get reader feedback on a digital newspaper you can actually get reader feedback now if you use that reader feedback meaningfully then you're actually that's digitalization of your business and you're making good use of the technologies that you've implemented Slightly more advanced example would be at the one that I've written there is if you are capturing your uh, the performance of your machines in your factory and then you are using algorithms to process that information and do intelligent things like schedule preventive maintenance, then you're truly digitalized, all right? And the last step is what we keep hearing all over the place as digital transformation. Now, digital transformation is actually quite an extreme step. Digital transformation is not only about technology, but it's also about changing the way you work, the way you live, uh, doing almost everything uh, in honest systems in a digital manner, right? And the, be okay to be at the digitalization level, all right? You don't really need to, or everyone doesn't really need to go into a digital transformation mode right away, right? Whereas that seems to be the common understanding that, oh, we must digitally transform. But no, if you can convince that you are well digitalized, I think you're good enough, right? Maybe still, maybe don't be on paper unless it's really necessary, uh, but at least move to the second level. You don't have to move to the third level. You can do it uh, uh, slowly and a little, you know, down the line, right? Now let's come specifically to the technology landscape. 
Before I actually show you, uh, talk about the technology landscape itself, uh, let me show you something that has been around for at least, I don't know, a little over a decade or maybe two decades. But this has been absolutely my reference and it's a brilliant thing that Gartner has created. I, I'm sure many of, not all of you have seen it before. Uh, but this is the Gartner hype cycle. And today, more than ever before, although this is almost a couple of decades old, or at least 15 years old, today more than ever, the Gartner hype cycle is very, very important, right? And if you take a look at what's on the screen, it's, it's, it's very clear, it's pretty self-explanatory, but the key things to understand are this. When a technology is, is created or invented, that's what is known as the technology trigger. Now, when something new comes up, it immediately shoots in all of our minds, all of us with no exceptions, to what we call peak of inflated expectations, all right? I'm going to take a very, very current example, which is ChatGPT, right? It was launched, I don't know, a month, couple months ago now, and immediately everyone said that Chat GPT is the universal solution to all my life's problems, correct? Now it also went to, I don't know, hundreds of millions of users of, you know, in a very short period of time and so on. Now it's not, honestly, it's not yet completely proven to be really relevant to many practical users. It's not been proven yet, but everyone believes it can do everything. So therefore it falls and clearly falls in the category of peak of inflated expectations, you know? and then what happens is a few people start to realize that this is not going anywhere and then everyone says, oh, this is absolutely useless and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, and that's what is called the trough of disillusion. Slowly things mature, people realize that there are certain use cases for that technology. It's not, it's not meant for everyone, but for some uses it's really good. That's what is called the slope of enlightenment. And finally, it's what is called the plateau of productivity. Now, what is interesting is that almost every technology goes through this cycle. And as a business, I think it's pretty important that you map where a technology lies as it is relevant to you, all right? This is not a one size fits all. You will hear that a lot from me. None of, tech, none of digital transformation or nothing of technology is one size fits all. You have to decide based on your requirements, your business maturity, uh, your industry, as to what is the technology that is relevant to you and therefore where does it fall in this hype cycle as relevant to you all right but if i was to give you a general thumb rule if i was uh, running an enterprise that you know needed to be stable and operational and you can't afford failures and so on i would generally wait till the technology reaches the plateau of productivity it's tried, it's tested, everyone's done their experimentation, failed and gotten up and fixed the mistakes. You know, that's the time as an enterprise you might want to get it, right? Uh, let the more experimental type of businesses uh, play around with it much earlier. Uh, we can wait, you know, the rest of us running other kind of businesses can wait till the plateau of productivity. So this is an absolutely brilliant tool, very, very old, but more relevant than ever today, okay? and. What I just wanted to show you, I'm not going to actually spend time on this, but I found a beautiful enhancement to the original Gartner hype cycle, all right? And why is this beautiful? Because it has started to introduce some of the modern day trends. For example, if you look at the, you know, the, the, the curve rising up to the peak of inflated expectations, you can see it also factors in VC investments. So it's saying that, you know, when the technology trigger happens, then that is when the first round of venture capital funding happens and so on, right? And that is uh, today's world, right? This, that is the Gartner hype cycle map to today's world. As far as businesses are concerned, nothing else has changed. We still wait for the plateau of productivity, all right? But I thought this was like an absolutely interesting variation to the hype cycle. So let's move on. Um, now, the second interesting thing that I want to show you before we get into the technology itself is the adoption curve. Again, an extremely old representation, nothing new about it. But as I said before, for the hype cycle, it is more relevant than before. All right. So very briefly, since I offered, I guess, uh, Rajiv Malan has decided to ask a question. So how do you comment on Metaverse? Which stage is it now? 
if you ask me purely my personal opinion i think it has gone into the trough of disillusion right i mean including the fact about how again none of this is verifiable to a great extent but how facebook has reduced its investment men in metaverse and so on so i would say people are suddenly realizing what are we going to do with this so but it's very subjective things change pretty rapidly in the tech world so we just keep waiting and watching and see what's good for you all right as a business all right now this adoption curve is the second and actually very uh, closely related to the hype cycle what i've been talking about for for so long all right let me okay let me just pause and take nikhil's question because it is relevant the question is how to identify at which stage is a technology uh, you know honestly there are two ways or there are two aspects to it one is the broad understanding or the broad feedback you will receive from the industry itself right quite often the industry experts will sort of tell you uh, how confident they are of their own technology let's take chat chat gpt you i have to say that open ai is being pretty transparent and admitting that chat gpt is not yet perfect right so that's one step so you have feedback from the creators themselves that it's not yet there the second way to identify is you look at it at from your business perspective are you in a line of business where something like metaverse is even relevant to you right now it may happen that as things evolve every business even manufacturing may find a use for metaverse may find but it's generally going to happen at a little later stage when the technology is matured a bit when the users have matured a bit and so on so these are the two ways where you can identify for yourself as to what stage every technology falls in all right so i hope i'm answering the questions to some extent but yeah a lot of it is subjective nothing it's again i'll say the word again it's never one size fits all but you can use these uh, parameters so this is very closely related to the hype cycle and the questions that were being asked see any user of technology is nicely classified in on this bell curve or in this bell curve uh, at the starting or the lowest end and the smallest percentage are innovators right that's the open ai guys who created chat gpt the next are the early adopters right as soon as the technology is out there they find an application for it and try to build something and and get out get get it out to the market right the next two categories are what are called early majority and late majority and as you can see between the two they form the the bulk of the users and at the extreme right you have the laggards right now for most uh, uh, businesses that are you know well, fundamentally running as a pnl i mean you you need to make profit i mean you're not just investing money in technology for the sake of it for the vast majority of them it is absolutely fine or let me put it like this it is highly advisable to be either in the early majority or the late majority all right try not to be a laggard yes that's not so great because then your competition is going to go ahead of you try not to be an early adopter because then you will pay uh, the price of all the mistakes of all the evolution of all the changes that come about right uh, so it's it's best to be in one of the early or late majority categories don't rush to adopt everything new that you see out there again just like the way i answered the previous question it's a little subjective watch your industry watch your competition as far as possible try to be in the early majority but not in the early adopters right and well definitely don't be a lagger okay so these two are the, uh, the the very old but still relevant and very useful um, uh, parameters to decide what technology you can use right now let's jump to what i think is the crux of uh, this session and you know it's very very huge so i'm going to largely talk about it at a very high level uh but you'll get a sense of where we stand also i have a a certain way of classifying these technologies which i hope will appeal to you and that sort of helps decide or helps navigate the landscape much better all right so i'll show you uh, the way approach that i have always used to to classify uh, uh technology so let's jump right in all right at the first step i look at infrastructure i mean I many times I operate from first principles so to run any computing solution I need my infrastructure right so it's a, it's the first place to start now with infrastructure you've got your traditional data centers you've got cloud computing you've got edge computing you've got serverless computing all of this is happening all of these are still being widely used 
uh, I suspect if if you go back to the mapping, I would say a majority is still either in data centers or cloud computing, and only a minority are moving to edge computing, right? And serverless computing, I would probably say you would be an early adopter if you get into it too deep for your business, right? So a very quick classification for infrastructure, but look at the options. You already have four options for infrastructure. Then look at data storage, right? So, you know, things, those of you who may uh, be from manufacturing or are aware of manufacturing systems, you used to have, or you still have a historian kind of a data store. Uh, relational databases have been around for the longest time uh, the newer kid on the block, but which has also been around for the longest time now is the NoSQL databases. Uh, you know, when you talk about big data, when you talk about unstructured data, uh, all of that, it fits much better in a NoSQL database than in a relational database. Then again, data warehouses have been around for the longest time. Data lakes is an extension to your NoSQL unstructured databases. But what is very interesting is that the new, the newest kid on the block, which is very today, is blockchain, right? Or distributed ledger technology. And the reason I still put that under data storage is, you know, to take a small uh, deviation. Look, blockchain and DLT have several applications and nuances, right? It's it's not it's not a one tiny piece of technology. It's it's a lot of technology. So the reason I also put it in data storage is the fact that uh, the concept in blockchain is that data storage is highly distributed. Data storage is highly peer-to-peer, -peer, right? So it is a very new form of data storage and I don't think we are, many businesses are there yet to start to adopt this. But it's interesting to know that maybe a few years down the line, I'm not gonna try and predict how many years, uh, it's very likely that a lot of data may be stored in in, in a blockchain kind of a uh, storage environment. So that was the next layer where, like I said, any computing solution needs infra, it also needs data. I'm actually going to jump one layer now, The or I, I'm never sure which order is correct, but I'm actually going to now jump to the human machine interfaces, okay? So traditionally, we're all used to, when you say computing application, we're largely used to a person sitting in front of the computer and inputting data, and then the computer does its work, right? But as you go forward, as technology and solutions and applications are evolving, the input, the source of input as we classically know it, is, is no more just humans typing on a keyboard, right? Or even, even tapping on a smart screen uh, of a smartphone. Even that is now old, right? It's been done. Uh, Solutions of the future are actually going to work a lot with uh, things like sensors, right? So a lot of machine to computer interfaces. So sensors, whether it's in your factory, your warehouse, on your trucks, uh, sensors and smart homes, uh, cameras, a lot of video feed from cameras to be fed into computing systems for analysis. There'll be a lot of inputs from drones, uh, there's going to be additive printing, which will actually directly print physical models of what you design on your computer. And of course, there's voice interfaces where we all, you know, a lot of us are probably using Alexa or uh, Google Assistant or Siri. And we already know that I can do a lot without ever touching the keyboard or the screen. So the point here is that, uh, you know, the, the, the input sources uh, for data is also changing very rapidly and the number of choices you have is just absolutely tremendous. So all of this needs to be factored in when you build your solutions, right? Now, the next thing I introduce is platforms, right? All of these input sources are going to need their own platform. So originally and you know from the early days, we've all had our ERP solutions. So they still need a little bit of human input, you know, whether it's a financial system, whether it's a uh, uh, a warehousing system and so on, or a CRM system, you still need a lot of traditional inputs from humans to get that system to, to, to process. But going forward, all of the new human machine interfaces that you see in the first layer are going to directly feed uh, data into these platforms, okay? And the final one is the processing layers. Now. Again, we've always had, I mean, computer processing is, is the core of what computing solutions do. But as we evolve, the kind of processing that computers do, 
is what is changing right so data analytics already very widely used image video analytics not so widely used but has tremendous potential in areas like for example security i mean you've got remote locations where maybe humans can't monitor you can just feed images to your system and uh, they can be processed right robotic process automation or rpa that's been around for a while so that's still evolving newer solutions are coming up uh, digital payments i mean nothing more happening than that right nothing more happening today that digital payment almost every transaction that requires payments can now be processed uh, uh, through a computing system and very very seamlessly at that AIML is is one of the more upcoming solutions so we are all looking at AIML solutions looking at how to apply them in our uh, uh, business applications and so on now i obviously don't have time to get into that that's a that's a story for another day but uh, i always find it very interesting to point out that AIML is you know you must look at AIML more from an application perspective AIML is actually a very very deep science but we in in when providing business solutions are not looking at writing algorithms we are looking to see how can ai ml solutions be applied to our business so and and the, actually the very next block next to it is is natural language processing which is actually nothing but a branch of ai ml right or even voice control or voice interfaces is nothing but a branch of ai ml so when we talk ai ml we must focus on trying to see how to apply that in our application and not so much the science of ai ml itself because that's in my you know what i call a, a phd topic and not meant so much for uh, a discussion in businesses right so there's a big difference between study of the science and application of the technology right and the last one of course uh, everyone's very excited again i you know i could talk a lot about blockchain it's in my personal opinion a very very exciting uh, technology Uh, I'm extremely gung ho about it. Um, if you ask me, if someone asks me again, where does that fit in the hype cycle? Uh, I think it is starting to get into the slope of enlightenment again. Completely my personal opinion, but uh, having understood it at in great depth, I think there's a lot of potential for how blockchain can be used in our uh, our industry and our applications. All right. So these are all the new processing layers that uh, that that are coming up. So if you look at the full diagram now you know this is a view of the technology landscape i may have missed a few things you get new things coming every day but very broadly this is how i categorize it think about your infrastructure what options do you want to use there think about your data storage what options do you want to use there processing platforms and what kind of uh, human machine interfaces uh, are you likely to build in your kind of a solution all right So in a way this uh this view that you see on the screen right now is actually the crux of what we're talking about the tech kit. So let's move on. Now this there's a small thing that I want to add in this session uh and and this is something that actually would be explored more in subsequent sessions is how do you decide fine now we've layered them now we understood that they go by infrastructure they go by uh, human machine interfaces and so on. but how do you really decide as a business or as a technology adopter or an influencer how do you decide what do i choose i mean you can't rely on the hype cycle and you can't rely on the adoption curve in its entirety so what else can i do to decide what technology to use again this is my way of classifying things but i look at things as to uh, what kind of value do they add to my business every solution right So the first thing I look at is what are my building blocks. Hmm? And let me just jump into it. So what are my building blocks? The first building block as I already talked about is infrastructure, right? So pay attention uh, the very first thing I would do is pay attention to your infrastructure. And the reason I say that is you know the classic story about how the foundation needs to be strong for your building to be you know be strong and so on. Uh that's exactly the same principle here. You may talk about AI ML right you may talk about blockchain you may talk about uh, uh, iot and sensors but if your infrastructure is not ready and infrastructure is not capable none of these layers above are actually going to work well enough so for me the first thing i focus on is the infrastructure for a business the second thing to focus on is your enterprise automation and going back to the whole 
digitization digitalization and digital transformation story right this the middle layer which i said at least you know it's good enough for many businesses that means you need to have some level of enterprise automation in place right whether it's an erp system for manufacturing whether it's for accounting whether it's for customer relationship management but make sure that your enterprise automation systems are in place i would think it would kind of be a very odd solution if i try to build ai ml solutions without even having any basic enterprise automation solutions in place all right so that's what i mean by the building blocks and that's how you need to layer things okay now let's the next one to focus on is data storage and data analytics now when you talk of things like iot or when you talk of something like a you know it's not technology per se but digital marketing as a business strategy it's going to actually give you a lot of data and a lot of unstructured data which will also give you a lot of noise it will also give you data that is of no value to you you know the the, the difference is let's say you're talking of a banking system or you're talking of an e-commerce system the transaction data is very controlled you only receive data that you expect bank transactions deposits uh, uh, withdrawals e-commerce purchases payments very structured data but if you are trying to use sentiment analysis using uh, social media data it's going to be this going to be a lot of uh, garbage as we say in that data so you'd better have your storage and analytics strategy in place before you go and build a fancy uh, sentiment analysis solution right or even iot if you have a series of sensors right all over the place they're going to feed you a lot of data what are you going to do with that data if you do, if you're not able to store it if you're not able to analyze it well what use is having an iot solution right so i hope i'm getting my point across but you need to make sure the foundations are uh, strong before you actually get into any of the fancier uh, solutions coming up from top right the second level is what we call uh, process improvements now once you've got the basics in place uh, see what you can do to improve and a very quick example would be adding some sort of ai ml at this point in time right so your enterprise automation and data analytics works well can i add a little bit of a decision making system to on top of that right so now that will improve my processes in some way then the third category is what i call future tech for a competitive edge all right so if you've got all your building blocks in place you've got some uh, process improvement solutions in place so you're you're already well digitalized okay yeah, at that point in my mind you're already well on your journey to having being digitalized now what can you do what more can you do you can do more to get a competitive advantage right so what are the kind of solutions you can put in so this is where your solutions like uh, 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 uh iot and you know uh, visual capture of uh, retail experiences or augmented reality you know that's the kind of future tech you can use to get a competitive edge and the last categorization is what i call disruptors right so disruptors are solutions for the future that are not yet ready for mass adoption they may not be relevant or mature enough to implement in your business but they are there on the horizon right so i mean let me put it like this definitely don't adopt a disruptor solution before you've got the rest of them in place right so that would that would really disrupt your business in not a very good way so this is the way i i classify uh, technologies by incremental value uh, i've defined what i mean by each one of them but what i'm going to do in the very next slide is show you a sample mapping of technologies and how they fit into this uh, incremental value mapping okay there you go all right so if you look at it the cloud computing the edge computing all of your network connectivity is what we call it infrastructure enterprise automation is the erps of the world process in databases we already know but look at what you can do in process improvement right so you can do iot you can do rpa you can do ai ml digital twins in the manufacturing space or many other spaces actually now and video analytics so these are going to now improve your process right uh, uh you know machine maintenance uh, security so many of these things can be improved by taking away extreme dependency on on on, on human intervention right so that's process improvements now future tech for a competitive advantage what can you do ar vr 
right? You can do AR VR for, let's say you're in real estate. You do AR VR to do a virtual uh, view of the uh, of of the house or the apartment you are selling. What that means is, I as a customer don't go don't have to go there physically, right? So that's giving you a competitive advantage. You can expand your markets. You can sell it to people who are not even in, in in the in the in the city that you are building in, and so on. Uh, drones, UAVs. We all know, for example, Amazon is trying to do delivery using drones. Uh, high traffic, high congested cities. I think this would be a brilliant solution, right? So these are all future tech that will give you a competitive edge. Is it easy to do? Obviously not. It's obviously not easy to do. And hence, I mean, if you do it, you get a competitive edge. Otherwise, everyone would have done it, right? Then there are voice interfaces. There could be many solutions out there that you could. And and actually, I haven't really put many. I mean, there's too many you can do. For example, facial recognition, right? So. Uh, and and one of the newer things that is coming up is the facial recognition at our airports. So uh, imagine the value that you're adding, where I can just uh, check in all the way to, to for my flight with just facial recognition. So the kind of future technologies that you can adopt to give your business a competitive edge. All right, uh, chatbots have been around for a while, but I still believe that they can do a lot of improvement on chatbots. But uh, yeah, they would still help. And the last category, which is disruptors, okay, is uh, what I put up there, which is uh, blockchain and uh, additive printing. Right now, the thing is, we're not yet ready. We're not yet ready for blockchain. We're not yet ready for additive printing as a uh, uh, as as a mass usage. Um, the use cases for additive printing or three D printing, as 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 is more commonly used is more if you're prototyping more for a uh, single use production or single use uh, you know, manufacturing it's not really yet ready to replace mass manufacturing right it's still not cost effective it still takes time and so on so these are disruptive technologies but are they going to become mainstream uh, given the current trend given the their current capability and potential i think yes right i think 3D printing is definitely something that's going to catch up and become mainstream. I don't again. That was the tech landscape, and then the last uh, session or the last topic I have is on an adoption strategy or uh, risk capacity. So depending on your risk capacity, you can decide where you want to fit on the adoption curve. If you're very conservative, then I would stay closer to you know the late adopters and so on. So those are the two ways you can do it. But there is one more way to look at it, and this I think is also uh, sort of very relevant and probably also more directly applicable to any business, right? And I call that the complexity value matrix. Now, every technology comes with a certain complexity of implementation. No technology is very straightforward, right? So you do have to do a, some sort of a benchmark on the complexity and. How much is going to cost you to implement uh, compared to the uh, business benefit you're going to get from it? Correct. Uh, let me start with this. So obviously, if you look at this quadrant, the the solutions that fall in the low complexity and low business value are somewhat easier to adopt. Right? They don't give you much value, but they're very quickly, uh, very easy to build. Right? The total cost of ownership is low. The time to market is low. But of course, the ROI also is quite low. We're talking about, but it's probably easier to do uh, something in that category, right? So you're not even. Uh, I mean, when you talk of high business value, yeah, it sounds nice, but also, you know, a lot of effort is involved in doing the solution correctly. So this quadrant is probably one way you can start off. Then you move to the high business value and still low complexity. So there's a low TCO and a high ROI and a low time to market. Okay. So easy implementation will yield high short-term value. Then you go to uh, the high business value and high complexity. Now this starts to get pretty difficult. Although the business value is high, uh, the efforts, the cost involved, everything is also very high. Even yeah, even uh, even though I'm saying the ROI is high, it's got it's very subjective and it's very dependent on your business, right? So this is a challenging implementation, but will yield high short-term value. And the last one, which, well, in my opinion, is all red, so probably just avoidable, is something that is low business value and very high complexity. Now, understand that this matrix is 
very specific to your business it's not there there is nothing there is no industry standard in this matrix right so i believe that everyone will have to take this matrix take the list of technologies and then decide what fits where so what i've gone and done just as an example right is i've mapped some technologies now like i've very clearly said it varies by industry and business so this is just a broad view potentially what do you think you can classify in any of these uh, quadrants okay so uh, if you look at the uh, the high business value and low complexity today i would say things like digital payments cloud computing data storage and analytics i mean just get there yeah they are all tried and tested solutions very easy to implement uh, and they for example digital payments in any e-commerce solution or any solution that requires b2c payments or even b2b payments i think is just a phenomenal solutions that we have today right uh if i look at high business value but high complexity then you've got the iot's you've got the ai ml you've got the uh uav drone solutions and so on and obviously the high complexity and low business value at least today i'm not talking ever i'm not talking for everyone but for many businesses for example uh, serverless computing doesn't add much value even ar vr which is such a high touted solution it doesn't really add value to every business and it's a pretty expensive proposition so you know this is the way you kind of do the uh, mapping so that you can decide uh, what solution is best for your business okay i'm almost done i'll just quickly walk through the five key takeaways right and they're mostly stating the obvious but i'll just walk through them anyway so the first thing is the technology landscape is vast right there's no way that any business is going to need or even be able to implement all of it in the short term second takeaway is that i've said this so many times digital transformation is not a one size fits all approach each business must decide what they need to do i don't think there is a, a benchmark you need to chase uh, watch your business watch your uh, the business maturity watch your industry and just do what is right for you all right there's no uh, right and wrong in digital transformation third takeaway watch where technologies lie on the gartner hype cycle for your business uh, industry may say something but you watch for your business uh, the fourth point is that everyone need not be an early adopter but try not to be a laggard that much i can see uh, you're going to lose out and be less relevant if all your competitions are ahead of you and the last one is the complexity value matrix uh it's a key deciding factor in your your adoption strategy customize it to your needs you will have to brainstorm your strategy and your technology teams will have to brainstorm and decide on the mapping right there is no uh, mapping you can get from anywhere else okay so i think yeah this this was my last slide for this session in the next session uh we go deeper and we talk about how we actually plan for and measure the impact and outcomes of technology investments It's okay to put everything on these quadrants and graphs and all that, but in the end, your CFO, your CEOs are all going to need actual metrics, KPIs, numbers. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the next session. All right. And with that, I'm done. So I'm now open for Q and A. Thank you so much, Vikas, for those insights. And uh, uh, Nikhil is asking another question, which is: It's a thin line between. Uh, Evading to be a, a laggard and FOMO on time to market for a new tech, how to plan it? Oh, so first of all, look, we are in a business. If you are, you know, uh, in a in a business that I call uh, jokingly, but I call a P and L business, which means you're genuinely concerned about making profits. Hopefully, uh, I think there's nothing in that space. There is nothing like FOMO. Okay, uh, you don't have to worry about FOMO if you are even even if you are a laggard. and as long as the technologies that you have implemented are working well sometimes you can actually have the the approach that says if it's not broken don't try to fix it right so don't ever use technology for the sake of it uh use technology with a view for the future if i don't make this change will i be irrelevant two years from now and if the answer to that is yes then yes invest the time and money on it but never do it for fomo so i if if you ask me direct answer be a laggard rather than worry about fomo uh there's another question from uh, rajiv if you could give a passing comment uh, technology versus roi how to convince leaders roi will come basis usage and acceptance 
yeah so yeah you're right it's a good question and i actually intended to go a lot uh, deeper in the next uh, session uh, i'm trying to see how hard how i can condense an answer in a minute <laughs> or so but uh, you know very honestly this is a very difficult option for any cio uh, this is a challenge uh, sometimes roi can take time um sometimes roi is non tangible i mean you may not uh, uh, see a direct realization of financial gain either on the revenue side or reduction in cost side uh, so yes it is very difficult uh, but then there are uh, to your point there are some kpis there are some metrics that you can apply and those can be translated into a language that the ceos the finance the cfos will understand and uh, that's that's the approach but like i said i'm sorry it's very hard to give it in a very short uh, response in the next session i'll go a lot deeper into this nikhil is asking is there some proven case studies uh, which should be explored for electrical industry manufacturing oh uh, yeah short answer is many i mean uh, in fact the question that i would ask back to you is uh, which technology areas are you looking at right i mean if you look at all of that i talked about in the landscape uh, at what space of all of the landscape are you talking about regardless of what you answer the answer is there are many case studies honestly look the short answer is that yes almost all of these technologies have very very relevant applications uh, for all these industries and therefore to your answer there are plenty of case studies in order in the meantime i just like to thank everyone for uh, joining and i hope this was useful uh, if i see you in the second session then i'll know it was useful so look forward to seeing you there thank you so much everybody for joining have a great evening ahead and thank you so much vikas happy to be here vita thanks so much for everything yeah. thank you so much bye bye all right thanks everyone bye, bye.